Hi, this is a art presentation today. I am Karen Mackway, and I will be discussing and showing you a very fun project. Um, I am a fellow with Oklahoma A Plus Institute. And today we're going to be studying, uh, first we're just gonna look briefly at a poster of this artist's artwork. His name uh, is George Chara, and he was a French artist that was known to be and started a movement called the Pointillist Movement. If you look at this painting, you will notice there are lots, it looks like lots of little dots. What's interesting about this artwork is it actually took him two years. Because uh, it took him so long, because every uh, little detail, there are actually not just hundreds or thousands, but millions of dots. And we'll briefly talk about some parts of our landscape, and this is what we're gonna be doing, is a landscape that is inspired by George Seurat. Um, I will hold this up here, and we will discuss the area of our landscape. Okay, so area, uh, I'm sorry, at the bottom, we have uh, things you notice um, are quite a bit larger, and then as it continues to go up, they get smaller. Okay, and so the reason why things are larger at the bottom is this is actually the closest area to this, known as the foreground. And we have, in the, in the foreground, we have a monkey, uh, we have a couple walking, and then you proceed a little bit up to an area called the middle ground. And you can still see a lot of detail in the middle ground here, but as you can see also, items are smaller, the people are smaller. Um, if there was an animal, part of an animal, it is also smaller. And then you, you keep going up into the area and you will see that uh, it, that is the background. The background is going to be things, especially like sky and hills. Uh, they will be considerably uh, farther away, so you're not gonna see as much detail. Um, to start our presentation today, to start your art project today, uh, I have a plain piece of paper, and I have it in the orientation of landscape. Um, landscape means it's like a wide shot and not a portrait, which would be narrow. So what we'll do first is we are going to make a straight line going all the way across from one side to the next. Okay, so we have this plain piece of paper. We're gonna learn some tricks, and the tricks are to make um, the, the paper to show depth. Depth is like you jump into the pool and the, the depth of the pool is seven feet. Well, in visual art, depth is showing things far and showing things close. So we're going to start with something, I, like I said, the horizon line. And when you make a horizon line, um, you don't want it to be in the middle. You want it to either be a little lower or a little higher. It makes it more visually interesting. So uh, I like to use a ruler to help me make a horizon line because you know I've been drawing quite a long time. It's really easy to make your line a little bit off. So a ruler's a great, uh, great help. You could use a piece of paper, all kinds of things you can use to help you make a straight line. So I'm gonna hold the ruler just a little bit um, higher on my page and I will take my pencil and go across And I have an eraser here. Okay, so now we have the first part of our landscape. Doesn't really look like a landscape yet. That's okay. We have a lot more to do. So next what I'm going to do is, this is going to be water on the lower two thirds and the upper two thirds, will, uh, the upper third will be uh, sky, mountains, and sun. So, when I like to draw hills or mountains, um, sometimes people think of them as triangles. They're actually a little more organic. Just have kind of fun with your lines. They don't have to be super perfect. And what I just did there was something called overlapping. Overlapping means something is in front of. Just like my hand is now in front of this paper, it's not that the paper is gone, it's just my hand is overlapping it. So I made this first layer, and I'm gonna darken it a little bit. 
And then I, behind it, I did another layer. And notice I stopped. I didn't continue drawing through. And the reason being is our mountains are not see-through. And be since this one's in front, how do we know it's in front? Well, one thing is it is overlapping. So anything behind it, it's going to cover up. So we did our two layers of hills or mountains. And now what we're going to do is we're gonna add a little piece of land at the bottom corner. This piece of land is kind of like where we're standing. If we're the viewer and we're looking at this landscape, and I'm just gonna make an easy peasy little, little area to stand on. Landscapes are one of my favorite things to draw and the reason being is they're everywhere. If you're going to school, if you're going to see your friend's house, look out your window, you'll see a landscape. What are some things that landscape has? Well, obviously they have land, but now what we're gonna draw is a tree. And we're going to draw a tree and it's going to be very large because the tree starts in the foreground. Anything that starts lower is going to be bigger because it's closer. So I'm going to make a tree and I will have to definitely erase. What I did is I overlapped. I overlapped our little piece of land. So having an eraser handy, the easiest way to fix it is I will erase that piece of land because the tree is now in front. Going to draw the base of the tree tree um, are organic shapes. So I'm not gonna do like a, a super perfect line, but if I was to compare this to a line, it's a little bit crooked, kind of slightly like a very crooked, messy zigzag line. And this is where the tree meets the earth, and then the roots go down into the earth. Okay, so now we have the top of the tree. I like to draw U's or V's. And this is where the tree branches out from the main trunk. So right here in the middle, I'm gonna draw a nice big U. And then on the sides, I'll have a V here. And I could even maybe do two right there. And this is a very simple, basic tree. Okay, now I'm going to do a tree that summertime is full of leaves so I'm going to do a soft wavy line, and my tree is very large, that's okay. But now what I need to do is I have some erasing to do. So taking my eraser, the, basically the trick to overlapping is knowing what to erase. And don't be afraid to make your tree nice and tall. And the reason why is your tree starts down low. It's very close to the viewer. So it's going to be large. It's going to take up a lot of space on your page. Sometimes with trees, I like to make a little thing called a peekaboo. If you look at a tree in the summer, you will see, you can still see parts of the sky through it. And so peekaboos are a great way to show those areas. So uh, what George Seurat was very, um, what he loved to paint was often like the painting I, sh uh, I sh uh, showed you, the Sunday of La Grangerie, is he liked to paint leisure paintings or, or outdoor uh, paintings of sailboats, ocean, that type of thing, a nice island. So we're gonna add a sailboat today and um, the easiest way to do a sailboat is I make a little wave. We're going to draw the base of our boat. And it's a small sailboat. It wouldn't fit more than probably two or three people. And then I make another horizon line connecting from either side. And the reason we drew the wave first is we want our boat to look like it's actually resting inside the water and not just, you know, levitating over the water, but actually in the water. So because a sailboat is propelled by wind, we are going to make a, two very tall parallel lines and this will be the mast. The mast was often made from a very 
tall, straight tree. Now our masks are usually made from metals and synthetics, but back in the day, they were often made from trees. So we're gonna start in the middle with two little lines going straight up. These lines will also be vertical. So there are two vertical lines that are parallel to each other. You can use your ruler or you can eyeball it. The only thing is you wanna make sure your lines don't accidentally become on the side of diagonal, meaning leaning to the left or to the right. So I'm going to overlap my heels again. And I still, uh, because I overlapped, you probably see some areas I need to erase because my sailboat is obviously closer. It's starting much lower than the mountains. So therefore it is covering up this portion of the mountains. Taking my eraser, I erase that one, the one that's a little closer and this part of the horizon line. So here we have a simple mast. Well, now what we need to do is we need to add the actual cells. The cells were a fabric that will take the wind and push the boat. It's an energy. So this boat is not using, for say, gasoline or steam. It's actually using harnessing nature's uh, wind. We want those cells to look like they are filled with wind, so you don't want to just draw a triangle because it doesn't give that illusion of the wind filling the cells. So we're going to do a curved line. I'm starting right here on the mast, and I'm curving out and coming back to the other side of the boat. Then I'm going to do go to the top of the mast, nearly the top, and I'm going to make a slightly curved line connecting and I'm going to do the same thing, start at the same point, and then I'm going to connect to the right side. And um, I do have areas where I need to erase. Cells used to be made from things in the very beginning, possibly even animal skins and then they would uh, weave fabric together, such as linen. We're going to make one on the other side and it's made the same way. Make a curved line going up and then connecting to the outside of the boat. Go to the top of the mast. And we'll do one more line going to the top of the mast, curving in to that left side. I have a saying that helps me a lot because erasing can get a little hard, especially if you drew really dark on your paper. So something I like to say to myself is I need to draw light till I get it right. And I want to draw dark and leave a big mark. Okay, so we're almost done with our basic composition, but what we're missing is a sun. You can choose if you wanted to do a sunrise or a sunset. That makes the water really pretty with all those rosy colors. You could do the sun just a little bit higher. You can even have the sun going off the page. Sun is a basic circle, so I think I'm just gonna do my sun in the corner. And as you can see, part of the sun is out of the frame. That's okay, when you look out the window, you don't see everything um, completely in the frame. Some of the things are just are cut off. That's how we perceive things as we are in nature or just walking along. I will actually add a, very quickly a cloud. A cloud is a soft organic line. Organic shapes are, are, are often seen in nature like a tree, a cloud, where um, something like the sun is more what we call geometric shape, triangle, square, circle. So we're gonna do a soft organic line and I just overlapped my sun a little bit. So because I know the clouds are a lot closer than that sun is, I'm going to erase this portion of the sun. Now comes a part if you'd like to add details to your sailboat. Some like to add a small little window here. 
Maybe you'd want to add a flag at the top. Maybe I've seen um, people that want to add apples to their tree. This is a good time to add those small details. Now, what makes it a pointless inspired painting is how we color it in. We're not just going to take a paintbrush and do our strokes like this or a crayon or color pencil. We're actually going to give the illusion of the dots, of the pointillism. And I, I told you previously, George Seurat was a pointillist artist and he was actually a contemporary of if you, another famous artist that lived during that time, Claude Monet, their styles were a little different. And we're going to do um, lots of dots, but don't worry, it's not going to be millions. Because, you know, he spent two years on that painting and we're just going to spend, um, you know, an hour, 30 minutes, whatever you like to do. And the great thing about this project is you can change so many parts of it. You could add another sailboat in the distance. But if I added another sailboat here, I wouldn't want to make it the same size because it's farther away. I would make it smaller. If I wanted to add a tree to this side instead, perfectly okay. This is just one example of a thousand different ways you could do a landscape. So if you have watercolors, here I have a watercolor set with our basic colors. Just like Gerard, George Seurat did, he didn't just use blue in the water he actually would put dots close together. So for instance, he might use blue with some purple and then even some reflection of yellow. When the eye sees dots close together, like we see pixels on a television screen, sometimes the colors actually become one as opposed to separate little dots. So I have some water here. And what we'll do is we'll dip our Q-tip Q-tips is a really great way to use this. You can also use marker dots. You can even use, take a crayon and make a circular motion. I like to start with the water. So I like when you have your paint, you don't want to dig in. You want to tickle the paint, tickle the paint. And the reason I start with the water is it is the largest area. And it's really, I'm going to show you some areas you really want to pay close attention to. So we know that this is water and we start our dots. Don't worry about being perfect. And also use different colors. Water is very reflective because it's wet, especially uh, on a clear day or at a sunrise. You're going to see all kinds of colors in the water. So you don't want to do just do blue for your water. Now the areas you probably notice I added some blue dots here. That's because those are those V's and the U's in the tree. So the tree's overlapping the water, but in these little areas, the water's still visible. You don't want to forget those little areas. And a good, another good thing to do is go ahead and just kind of trace your horizon line, but be very careful to stop at that first cell. Then this little portion here is water. There's the mast. I continue. There's the other cell, and then I'm going to go across to the horizon line. That really helps me remember that I have a lot of overlapping and I just need to be ca uh, cautious and remember that. So these areas, blue's a good color to start with. And then what I'm going to do is we're going to talk about some other colors to add to your painting because like we discussed, water is very reflective. You're going to see many colors inside the water. This is a large example. Usually I do smaller examples. So we're going to go ahead and discuss and show if we used some purple. And it's okay to overlap those blue dots. Being that I have a sun and the corner, uh, the sun would probably be reflecting a little bit of yellow. Now notice I use the same side for the purple and the blue, but when I add things like yellow, I do not want to use the same side as the purple. The reason being is those colors, since it's wet paint, will mix 
and make a brownish color. And that's not really what we're going for in our water at the moment. So I will turn it to the other side to add a reflection. In the project today, I referenced uh, contrasting colors, also known as complementary colors. And here I have a color wheel to give you that example. We have, which first we'll review the three primary colors. There are three primary colors, yellow, red, and blue. When you mix two of the primaries together, you get something called a secondary color, and that would be green, orange, and purple. So we have the example of our primary and our secondary, and then when you take a secondary and mix it again, you will get like the red violet, the blue violet, but the violet would be the secondary, whereas the blue and the red are the primary that will make the secondary. So when I talk about contrasting colors, these are colors that are opposite the color wheel. They're opposite each other. So if you look, we'll take red. Red's here at the bottom. And you go opposite, that means go all the way across. What color do you get? You get green. Now red and green next to each other make each other brighter. Think of Christmas colors. However, if you mix red and green paint, you don't have a nice vibrant color. You would get a neutral color like a grayish brown. The next complementary pair, there are three pairs. This is our first. <clears throat> the next one is yellow. So we're gonna take yellow, we're gonna go all the way across our color wheel and we end up with violet. There are some sports teams that have these colors and why? Because they're very contrasting, they complement each other, they make each other look brighter, they stand out. But again, you don't wanna mix these colors to get a nice bright color. You can mix them to get a neutral though. And the neutral is the grays, the browns. The last complementary pair is the color of our sports team, Thunder. It is orange, it would go all the way across to blue. Orange and blue are our last complementary pair and you would mix those if you wanted a neutral and you could put them next to each other if you wanted a lot of contrast, meaning if you had blue water and we discussed and you might want to have uh, something like a, a sailboat with the orange color would complement it very nicely and really stand out, whereas a color next to blue would not stand out as much. It would make it, it would, uh, the color next to each other would be a color family, but we are talking about contrasting colors, complementary colors, and those are opposite each other on the color wheel. So I'm gonna turn it around. And again, I tickle the paint. I don't wanna dig in. That's a real good way to use too much watercolor and to make your water dirty too fast. Here is my sun, so I'm gonna go ahead and trace it in. I want it to be very vibrant. And I like to add to my sun, not just yellow, but some orange. I'll add the orange in just a little bit. Cause I'm wanting to put a yellow, just a couple, just a hint of yellow in the water. I don't want it to go up. And, and like I said, I, I did, um, overlap the purple and the blue dots. I don't want to do that with the yellow. I will find a portion that doesn't have any color and I will add the yellow to that area. And also I don't want to overwhelm the yellow because it's just a reflection. It's not a large area. If you have a sunrise or sunset, you can use more of those rosy colors in them. So after I've uh, worked on the water, I like to go ahead and work on the sky. As you can see, the sun's fairly high, so the sky would have lots of blue in it too. And that's a good way to keep your, your um, Q-tips nice, is use the same color at the same time. So you're not constantly switching out Q-tips and mixing colors. And the same thing applies, keep the colors close. Look for little areas, like the little peekaboo in the tree. That little area is some sky, so I do wanna show that. And I might just go ahead and carefully kind of remember my horizon line. And here we have really tiny areas of overlapping. So if you, and you know what? I see a spot I should have erased a little better. The top portion of this left cell is still not overlapping, but now it is. 
So in this area, I'm going to really carefully tiny, make my dots. If you have a really small area and you're worried that your Q-tip might just flub over that area, mess it up, you can take a marker or a crayon and you can make your tiny dots with that. And it's a nice thing to do because it's very precise and it's smaller. I have a couple finished ones I will show you in just a minute. Now, we really want some other colors in. Um, and I would start next with the greens. We have, if you wanted this area to be green grass, and this we already talked about, it's a full tree in the summer. I actually made this what's called a deciduous tree. Deciduous means the leaves fall off during autumn, during fall, but right now it's really full of leaves. And then we have these mountains in the background. So if I want the areas, I don't want them to all be the same green. So what can we do? Well, what we can do is we could add a little bit of yellow in this area, make it look close and vibrant. This area could be more just greens, even maybe a hint of a blue. And then in the mountains, a trick that many artists have used over the years, uh, particularly even one, Leonardo da Vinci, they would add blue and purple to make things look far off. And that is called atmospheric perspective. It gives the illusion that even though we know this is close, we know this is just a flat piece of paper, it's an illusion, it's a trick to make our eyes think, okay, those mountains are far off. So starting with the, um, the yellow, we could add some yellow at the base. And yellow often, light colors tend to make things come forward or protrude. Darker colors can often um, give the illusion of things receding back. And that is also another way of discussing depth. Depth, we used that word earlier. It means things far, things close. Um, and oh, right here, I'm gonna add some green. The element of art that's used to describe that is called space. Space. And just like in the movie Wally, when they said there's plenty of space in space, which is true, there's a massive amount of space out in space, there's space in this room. There's space in the car. So now I'm gonna go up into the tree and start adding my dots. And I'm probably not gonna add a lot of uh, yellow because I want it to look different from the grass. I want it to stand out. And you can always come back in and add more color. Sometimes you see an area that needs a little more um, fullness. There's too much white. You can always go back in and add some things like that. Landscapes became very, very popular during the Impressionist and the Pointillism. Um, people loved to start a painting actually outdoors instead of a studio, and it was called plain air painting. So you could do this outside with a house. It doesn't even have to have water. A landscape can just have trees. It could have a... Um, a hill, it doesn't have to have a hill. It can be completely flat, it can have grass, it could be flowers. And so then we have the hills in the background. And I want them to look, especially this one back here, I want it to look a little farther away. So I'm going to add a little purple. Using purple in the hills will help to show that illusion of depth and we don't wanna just use purple though. So we're gonna fill it in and that purple tends to be a really dark pigmented color. So you wanna be very careful that you are just tickling the paint, and not digging in because it will quickly get extremely dark. And it's always easier to add paint than try to take some away. And then a good thing to do is I'm gonna add just a hint of green. I have some markers ready. The reason I like to use markers for portions of the sailboat is small areas 
it is a little bit harder to make things uh, stay in the lines with watercolor and a Q-tip. So markers are a easy way to show that and an easy way to color in those areas. Some colors to think about when you're doing this are if you have lots of green and blue like we do today in the water and the hills, we probably do not want to use um, green and blue in our sailboat. The reason being is it will become camouflaged because it's, it's too alike what's next to it. Just like an animal that is camouflaged is blending into its environment, we want our sailboat to actually stand out. To make it stand out, what we will do is we will add um, some bright colors. So the complementary color, that means the color opposite on the color wheel to blue is orange and to purple is yellow and the opposite color of green is red. Those are really great colors to use in your sailboat to make it pop, to make there have a lot of contrast. And the bottom of your sailboat, if you wanna be more traditional, is going to be, um, often was made from wood, just like our tree trunk. And you can use a Q-tip that's already have color on it because you're using brown. And you can start in your tree trunk and remember those little peekaboos, there's a couple areas in here that will also have some brown. And I really like to go over those areas that I erased previously from overlapping, just to make sure there's no lines of things that are behind still showing. And I can also, because water is going to show things around it, I can add just a hint of brown down here. That will help to show a reflection. And again, just like we didn't want our heels to all look the same, I could add into the boat some black dots to complement it. You just wanna be careful with some of these darker colors it's good to, I like to do a lot of times the darker color towards the end, just for that reason. Um, and then the mast, or maybe I wanted to go, um, you know, now, nowadays the mast is more made from a metal or a synthetic materials. So maybe a grayish color that's gotten, and as you can see, that got dark very quickly. So I can take, if something gets dark, what you do, a little trick is you can take your Q-tip or your paintbrush and pat that dark area and you can actually move it around into a place that needs some more color. That's a good thing to do because it, it's very easy to get maybe a, a little bit too much pigment on your brush. So um, like we discussed, our cells. We don't want to use blue, we don't want to use green, and we don't want to use purple. So the colors we can use would be a red. A red would be a great color to use, but oranges are good. And you can also mix colors. Sails have designs on them. This is a very simple design. So I was going to show you if you wanted to do dots with markers, it would look a lot like this. Maybe you would like to trace in the area first with that color, especially if you want this cell to boat to really stand out and be like where all the emphasis of the painting is. That's a good thing to do to make it really have a lot of contrast to the background. And the fun thing about this is you, you could go back in and at, do reflection of the cell. So add just a little bit of red at the bottom because the reflection's below. Uh, we discussed adding orange to our sun to give it more vibrancy. You could put tiny small dots in the uh, water of orange, but again, don't mix the colors, meaning don't put an orange on top of the purple or on top of the blue because the color will no longer be vibrant. It will be a neutral like a grayish brown. I have some examples of some finished ones, and these were done by different students, and this is their interpretation of the project. 
So as you can, if you look closely, you will see that they have mixed colors and everyone has done it a little bit differently. Looks like pink and red were the popular colors for their sailboats. And that's the great thing about this project is you can take it to so many levels. You can add your own designs, your own colors. These are just some very basic principles to how to create a inspired, a pointless inspired landscape. Thank you for watching and I hope you have a wonderful day.